let uh, inshallah us begin with a very brief exposition of uh, this the rational and the spiritual proofs for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of a map of what we would like to cover uh, this brief uh, summary is in reality a, a longer seminar of about maybe four hours or so that's part of the applied seminars of the Sahba Seminary. The seminary has about 32 applied life seminars on different topics. Uh, this would be the topic of the theme of setting the record straight. Uh, but there are seven other themes, and the idea is that these are intensive, uh, ilmi, insha'Allah, uh, discussions on contentious topics in modernity. Uh, but we're going to try to uh, extract elements of that seminar only, uh, because we have an hour with one another, and then perhaps uh, some questions after Maghrib Salah. So, we'll be looking at the following. Uh, a brief discussion of Yaqeen, very briefly, or certainty. And then uh, we will pivot from that to uh, why is our age an age of so much doubt? What is the philosophical basis behind that? Then the idea of do we really need any arguments to prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we really need arguments to do that? Then let's look at some rational arguments in brief, four of them. Many of you might know about these arguments, but a brief discussion of these four arguments that are very powerful. Uh, the first one is probably the most powerful argument for the existence of Allah and um, was expounded by our scholars, our scholars of uh, scholastic theology or kalam. And then let's look at the spiritual arguments for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, by select hikam of Ibn Ata'illah rahimahullah ta'ala very, very moving, very powerful, very rational, spiritual proofs for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then a discussion of uh, how do we lose yaqeen? Uh, and then how do we, inshallah, gain yaqeen? That, inshallah, is what we hope we can cover in an hour, uh, select as aspects of the, of the applied learning seminar. Uh, we will not go into much depth because of time. Um, time makes it impossible. So to begin, um, the rarest and most precious gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given human beings uh, is stated in a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam in which he says مَا نَزَلَ فِي الْأَرْضِ شَيْءٌ أَقَلُّ مِنَ الْيَقِينَ that there has not been revealed to earth or not descended upon earth meaning the inhabitants of earth anything rarer more precious more rare than Yaqeen. And he says in another text, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Naja awwalu hadhi al-umma bil Yaqeen with Zuhd. The first of this Ummah, the earliest generations, they succeeded and were saved by Yaqeen, by their certainty. So We have Yaqeen from the text as the rarest gift from Allah Azza wa We also have from the, from the text the idea of Yaqeen being um, that which gives us salvation, that, that, that which saved the earliest generations. And there are many, there are many other beautiful texts 
on the topic of yaqeen as well from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And of course, it's easy to make the argument if we ponder why is, why is yaqeen so valuable? Uh, why is it so transformative? Because belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and certainty in that belief is going to mean belief and certainty in his names and attributes, belief and certainty in the uh, arkan of iman, uh, the integrals of faith, which is sort of the, the context of our existence, that I live in a world where Allah is. I live in a world where the angels are. I live in a world that is connected to an other world of judgment. I live in a world where Allah has sent prophets. I live in a world where Allah has revealed himself and what he wants of me, the context of my existence. So if I have yaqeen, I'm going to have yaqeen in the environment and the context of my existence. And then I'm going to have yaqeen in the Anbiya. I'm going to have yaqeen in Sayyidul Anbiya, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm going to have yaqeen in what he brings. I'm going to see every aspect of the shar as true, as real, as beneficial. I'm going to take seriously every command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to take seriously every prohibition of Allah ta'ala. Nay, I will take seriously every mustahab. I will take seriously every makruh. Nay, I will make everything either mustahab or fard. I will focus my life on fundamentally that which Allah loves, which are the mandatory acts and which are the mustahab acts. That's what he loves. If I had yaqeen, everything else I would strive to leave and avoid. Because even though it is not prohibited, it's not what he loves. And I have yaqeen. So I will live for only what Allah loves. I will lo live in the in the envelope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mahabba. It also means, hafidhikumullah, as we saw today, that all of the akhlaq, all of the akhlaq brought by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, innama bu'ithtu li utammima makarim al-akhlaq, I was only sent to beautify, I was only sent to perfect beautiful virtues and norms of living, of conduct. Akhlaq. I would take all of those akhlaq seriously if I had yaqeen. And so you can see how having yaqeen, something that we might say, yeah, but can yaqeen really do it? Yes, it can. And it's not something small. It's something great. It's something great, grand. Yaqeen is ihsan in another way of looking at it. Yaqeen is a level among the levels of ihsan to worship Allah as though I see him. Uh, and if I don't see him, I know, have yaqeen that he sees me. And that, as we said, will transform my entire life. And yaqeen lives, as you know, not in the mind. Where does yaqeen live? In the heart, in the qalb. Yaqeen is a spiritual emotion. It's not an idea. We all know what yaqeen means. Certainty, you know what it means. To believe in something as though you see it, as though you have tasted it, as though it is palpable, observable, as though you are living, seeing, quote-unquote, the divine. Uh, meaning, Allah is so real to you in every sense. You're so aware of Him, subhana, in every sense. It's like you see Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the place of that is not in the mind, because we know, we all know what that is. Intellectually, I'm, I'm discussing it with you intellectually. Whether I feel that, whether I experience that, truly, whether I taste that spiritually with my heart, that's a different discourse. So knowing something mentally versus experiencing it is very, very different. And what we're speaking about here, the yaqeen that transforms, is that yaqeen that has resided in my 
my qalb. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an uh, was a siddiq. And when the ulama speak about him, they said that he didn't, he didn't excel the others upon the opinion that he was the best of the Sahaba, but there are other opinions, like Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala as well. That's also an opinion among some of the ulama. But upon the opinion that he's the best, or even if he wasn't the best, of the highest and greatest, he excelled them not because of uh, the great proportion of his salah, and he made a lot of salah, or his siyam, but shay'un waqara fi qalbi, something that penetrated his qalb, something that entered his heart of certainty. And he was a siddiq, meaning to testify sincerely to Allah's existence. That's another way of saying perhaps yaqeen. But we live in an age of, of doubt, of incredible doubt uh, that has started historically at a certain point in our modern history, you could say, and has stretched and stretched and stretched and now we live in the shadow of uh, immense doubt in the divine, in the values of the divine, in the unseen in general. And that affliction, that terrible affliction, affected the Muslim world, you could say, fundamentally after the fall of the Ottoman Khilafah, and was exported from uh, the Republic, and uh, Mustafa Kemal uh, to the rest of the Muslim world. Uh, and those ulama that lived in that very momentous time, like Sheikh al-Islam, Mustafa Sabri, rahmallahu ta'ala, he speaks about the export of that to Egypt, for example, and what he found in Egypt of immense entrenched secularism, even at the ranks of some of the Egyptian elite ulama. And then to the rest of the Muslim world, Pakistan and others later on to the extent that this uh, incredible nagging doubt about the constants of our deen afflicts us at the level especially of the elite. So this philosophy, it has many causes. Of them perhaps the uh, main cause would be philosophy of materialism, that only the material exists. Materialism as a philosophy only that which is observed truly exists and has value. Materialism, philosophically. And practically, materialism in terms of the way in which we live. Muslims and, I would say non-Muslims and, Muslims. That we live practically, though we may not believe philosophically in materialism, uh, we may live, I may live the life of a materialist. That is, my connection and my awareness to the non-material world is very, very dim. It's not real. I don't see it as real. You know, the wall between between this world and the ghayb for the early ones was very thin. Very thin. Almost some of them not, not even there. The, you know, a gaze through this world into the next world, it was very accessible. They lived in their emotions, in their mind, in their, in, in their hearts, as though they saw the Akhir, as though they were, you know, seeing Jannah, seeing Nar. And these ultra, supra material realities were very true, very real. They never doubted them. But because of materialism, as a philosophy, the idea of all that exists really is matter and what can be experimented upon, that generates a practical materialism, which is that I therefore live for uh, a life of only a body. I live to eat, to drink, to be entertained, to find ways to satisfy uh, my sensual pleasures, uh, I find different ways to entertain myself, different ways to satisfy my carnal pleasures, more eating, more drinking, 
that's the way I live, and that's the life of, of a materialist. That's the life ultimately of a hedonist, which stems from, uh, unfortunately, a break between uh, me and my ability to interact with the unseen. It's like the density of matter, the thickness of the density of matter, bars and veils me from the unseen. And my interaction with matter, with the world, with things, and my attachments, essentially my attachments, my alaqat, my ta'aluqat, my attachments to things are so powerful and strong, they form the foreground of the way I think, the way I feel, the way I live, because of those strong attachments, uh, those strong attachments of the nafs or the lower self. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا So we know, they know the apparent of the world. They know, and now we see how true that is. How much do we know about the apparent workings of the world? How much do we know? What are the things that human beings are able to, by Allah's permission, accomplish? To innovate, not to create, but to innovate and to discover, and to generate incredible, incredible things. يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا It's only, you know, the, the face, the superficial face of this world. And dunya means the lower world. If it's something is dunya, it means uh, an adjective to mean low, close to you but low. Because dunya is a lower world. It's a lower form of existence. It's not a higher form of existence. It's the form of existence in which my body resides. But where my qalb resides, where my ruh resides, is a higher and more noble. It's a richer form. It's a form of existence that has more dimensions. And because it has more dimensions than a 4D world, more levels of freedom and more levels of happiness. Uh, the realm of the qalb, of the soul, uh, the realm of the, uh, of the uh, if you like, sacred aspects uh, of who I am. وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ So they know, you know the world, the apparent of the world, but عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ that, that which is to come, or that which is beyond the world, هُمْ غَافِلُونَ they don't know anything of that. They are heedless of that. And therefore, very famous scientists, as you know, very, very famous scientists may know a lot externally of things. But in terms of their realities and meanings, the deeper meanings and the unification equation of Tawheed, which they are searching for mathematically, they have no idea. We are like children, kindergarten children, when it comes to the higher realities, the noble realities, the truths behind uh, what exists. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the infinite subhanahu, to know the infinite. You know, the Muslim who knows the infinite, the simple Muslim, Muslima, let's assume uneducated, that knows Allah Ta'ala, that knows the infinite, and that loves the infinite, that worships the infinite. Her compared to who? The greatest of the astrophysicists, quote-unquote greatest, who's better? Who's smarter? Me, who's smarter? Who knows more? Who's richer? Who's safer? Who's better? Who would you want as your neighbor? Who would you want as your mother? Who would you want as your father? Who would you want as your friend? In every realm, the simplest mu'min, mu'mina. You know, and I'm, I'm saying this because I have someone in mind, very simple, you know, didn't have an opportunity for education. You know, my grandmother. I, I would, I, I would, I would give anything to live her life. If I could live like her, and and die in the way that she died, 
uh, if I could give up everything that I know of, of uh, secular knowledge, I would. I would. Uh, because of the value, the value of someone who knows the divine, the infinite, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, do we really need to prove Allah's existence? Uh, well, only because my iman is not strong enough. Only because I don't have yaqeen. To be very fair, but also very direct. Uh, yes, it might help. Alhamdulillah, it would help some of us maybe strengthen our iman. And those who don't have iman, they may bring iman by the rational proofs for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. But, for example, a few days ago, I was traveling. Fasi Muhammad knows him. One of, the, uh, one of the students of the Sahba Online program, Brother Yalchin. Uh, and uh, one of the students to be in the seminary, bi'iznillah. And uh, he said, well, what are you sharing of applied learning seminars? And I mentioned at one point, probably, we'll be doing the rational and spiritual proofs for Allah's existence. So he said, SubhanAllah, is he that distant that he has to be proven? Is he that distant that he has to be proven? Uh, and he's taken that from his other learning of what the ulama, especially in the spiritual sciences, have said regarding this point. But the point being that the mu'min, the Muslim, mu'mina, with iman, and of course, yaqeen. With yaqeen, we don't need anything. We've already seen it with our hearts. We already know it with our hearts. You will not increase me by giving me a mathematical or rational proof. I know it. That's what yaqeen is. But even with iman, do we really know it? In some sense, because it is part of the fitra. It is part of the fitra before uh, my fitra was bent and warped and changed. Uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extracted, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ When Allah ta'ala extracted from us in that plane of souls beyond this dimension, beyond the time as we know it, when we were all present in some way uh, in the divine presence and Allah Ta'ala uh, extracted from our min uh, zuhurihim in some sense from our genomes could say from our genetics uh, in a modern way zuriyatahum everyone to come everyone to come in that in that world of souls of plane of souls was there was extracted you know from my DNA whatever was to come, because it's all written. It's all encoded. Allah has encoded it already. Uh, and a very powerful meaning of his qada and qadr. It's already encoded. That's his control over me, subhana. Not that it denies me in any sense free will. I have free will, and I have agency. But this is the extent of his power over me. It's all in me. It's all encoded. Every detail of what I'm going to be, how I'm going to grow, what hair is going to go white, and at deeper levels of meaning, that's only what we know. What about other aspects of encoding, emotionally and otherwise? Subhana, subhana. So, at that moment, Allah Ta'ala says, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And we said, we said, I said, you said, you said it. You said it in your spiritual memory. You know, if we go beyond the amnesia that comes with being a human, you and I said, Bala, of course. We didn't even say na'am because of the way in which it was. Alas to be rabbikum. We say na'am, actually that's the wrong answer. Bala, but of course, that key, that emphasis. Yes, you are indeed our Lord. So we know that instinctively. And in the fitra, in that primordial essence of who we are, that uh, is an experience. We, we, 
we experience Allah, we read Allah Ta'ala's signs, we receive the wahi from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we accept it's from Allah Ta'ala's Rasul and Beloved. And all of that confirms what we already know. It's meant to confirm what we already know. And there's a story of, it's, it's known in the, in, the, in the study of Aqidah and Kalam, the old woman and Imam Ar-Razi. When Imam Ar-Razi was visiting, um, at that point, uh, Nisapur, and he was with an entourage of students. And you would know Imam Fakhruddin Ar-Razi, mashallah, um, a master in the rational sciences and in the Islamic sciences in general, a giant in that field, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he was with his entourage of students. And then he passed an old woman. And the old woman said, who is he? She asked one of the students, who, who, who is this? And they said, this is, this is Ar-Razi. said, who is Ar-Razi? They said, he is a scholar and he, he has... Um, he has Jama'a al fadalil He compiled a thousand proofs uh, rationally now uh, about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then she says, is he really that great? She says, if he didn't have a thousand doubts, he wouldn't have created a thousand proofs. If he didn't have a thousand doubts, he wouldn't have to need a thousand proofs. Of course, Imam Ar-Razi, rahimahullah ta'ala, did not have a thousand doubts. He's compiling it because we have a thousand doubts. What the ulama need to do is not because they do it because they need to do it. They do it because we need it. So Imam Marazi doesn't have a thousand doubts that he's now intellectualizing through the proofs of Kalam. Nonetheless, the point being, you see from her, from her perspective, and then the students told him of that, and then his famous words, Allahumma imanan ka imanil ajais. Ya Allah, give me iman like the iman of the old woman. <laughs> of the old woman. You know, let me die in that state of iman that ultimately doesn't have any doubt. Because, of course, you can have a lot of rational knowledge, doesn't mean you don't have any doubt. And the nature usually of rational knowledge and argumentation is there's always a counterpoint. Point, counterpoint, point, counterpoint, point, counterpoint. As Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, says, it doesn't lead you to yaqeen. By itself, the rational sciences, they're very powerful, and very helpful, and very important, but they don't, by themselves, lead us to yaqeen. So, that said, we're still going to look at some of the rational proofs and some of the spiritual proofs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence very, very briefly. And we're going to look at the link between the two. So we've chosen to do the spiritual proofs as well uh, because of a reason, which inshallah hopefully will become apparent. And they're both linked anyway. The, the rational proofs actually flow into the spiritual proofs. And the spiritual proofs are themselves very, very profoundly rational. Uh, and we will see that essentially the Qur'an contains all of them in a nutshell, in a non-didactic way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some have argued of the ulama, Allah is not proving his existence in the Qur'an because that doesn't need to be proven. Allah is not proving it in the way in which the rational sciences would do that. Allah is mentioning many things about his creation. And implicitly, the ulama derive certain proofs. And all of them are actually derived, if you look carefully, from the Qur'an, actually. But Allah Ta'ala is not expending his energy to convince me that he exists, subhana. Uh, he is appealing to my fitrah to confirm what I should already know. And telling me many things that if I do, will make my faith stronger. There are many things that we do, we practice, that give us doubt. See, we're the sources of our own doubt in many ways. We are the doubters. We, we generate our own doubt by doing things. Like, like what, for example? 
please forgive me. I would not, I would not eat or drink in a class of ilm, uh, but uh, I think, I think I may have to. Uh, what would be, what would be one of the things that make us doubt? That we do. Excuse me. Yeah, <clears throat> we disobey Allah Ta'ala, we commit dhunub, and when we commit dhunub, Jazakillah khairah, may Allah bless you, Jazakillah khairah, I was hoping someone would do that. Um, we commit dhunub, we disobey Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and what does that do? It darkens our hearts, and when the heart is darkened, it can't perceive properly, it's veiled, it's like a mirror that can't reflect. And then I can't reflect the realities of the unseen. And then I start to doubt. And how did the doubt start? Not because there was a doubt in reality. Because I disobeyed Allah Ta'ala. And that has a trace, an athar. لِكُلِّ ذَنْبٍ athar. Every dhamb, every disobedience has an impact, a residue. And that residue darkened my heart. And then when my heart was dark, I couldn't see. And because I was blind, I said there was no light. But there is light. I just can't see it. I'm to blame. And much of atheism, by the way, follows this path. Rarely do you ever find you know, a pure-hearted, obedient to Allah, Allah-loving, practicing atheist. Often you find those who are immersed in something and want to justify their immersion in it. Emotional atheism, self-serving atheism, not rational atheism, because they want to continue their life of disobedience. And they don't want to be held to any account and any standard. And Allah Ta'ala speaks about that in the Quran in very powerful ways. So by committing dhunub, you know, uh, al, uh, they say... Uh, See, the barid al kufr. The them, the disobedience, is like the mailman of kufr. Because after a while of continuous disobedience, it's going to lead me small sins, big sins. It's going to lead me on the path of the biggest sin, which is kufr. And that's often what happens. But we may not connect it. We just think about it. Well, he's got a rational objection. Oh, no. a lot's happening inside deep within the, uh, the iceberg of the self that psychologically, emotionally is justifying so-called uh, ideas and attitudes and philosophy. So, the four arguments. One is, I'm sure you've heard of many of them, the contingency argument. Um, and the ulama have, have, have uh, discussed, they've discussed all of them. And actually, to be honest, our ulama have discussed them. And then later, uh, Western philosophers came, like Thomas Aquinas and others, and in many cases they pawned, no problem, to take from those who come before you, but to attribute to them what you took. And, and then after a while it becomes now like, actually, uh, they're the progenitors and originators of these arguments. And even some Christian apologists, for example, one of them, you know, he calls... Uh, when he, you know, when he, when he brings his contingency argument and he mentions Imam al-Ghazali, he calls him the Persian philosopher. The Persian philosopher. Because they want to hide the fact that these powerful rational arguments came from, from our ulama and they're part of our legacy. So, the contingency argument, the, they call it the kalam, cosmological argument, the fine-tuning argument, and the mathematical argument, and there are others, and some are stronger than others, uh, and some are not very strong, that sometimes might be, uh, might be used. These would be, I think, Allah A'lam, the strongest of the arguments that exist. So from the Qur'an. So let's look at the contingency argument very briefly. So, from the Qur'an. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدَ اللَّهُ الصمد. Say that Allah Ta'ala is one. 
indivisible. Allahu Samad, everything needs him, he needs nothing. That's the idea of Allah Ta'ala's Samadiyya. Allah Ta'ala is completely independent. Everything needs him, he needs nothing. In another text, Ya Yuan Nas, Antumul Fuqara U Ilallah. O you who believe, uh, O oh, oh, humankind, excuse me, Antum, you are Al Fuqara, you are the needy for Allah. You need Allah Ta'ala. Wallahu huwa al ghaniyul hamid and Allah Ta'ala is free from all wants. Allah Ta'ala is self praising. Antumul Fuqara, Antum al Fuqara, you are the truly needy for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So the argument essentially says that being, existence, being is of two types. Mumkin, possible being, and wajib, necessary being. Okay? Mumkin, possible being, is being, which is everything in the universe, that cannot create itself. Meaning, its being is possible. It's possible that it is, it's possible that it is not. It didn't create itself. Right? It's merely possible to exist. How do we know that? At one point, it didn't exist. How do we, at one point, it's going to stop existing. It's merely possible being. Mumkinul wujud, or contingent being. We know that because when things pop up, you know, whenever I see things, I know they didn't at one point exist, right? This water bottle didn't simply exist. Imagine if it just popped out of thin air, and then I said, you know, that's how things are. They just pop into existence. Well, I know that's not how things are. Things were not, and then they were. Now, contingent beings cannot give themselves being. Right? They're mumkin, they're only possible. It's like the scale is, is balanced. Being, non-being, right? It's balanced. Something has to come and do what? Tilt the balance to give it being. Because rationally, and this is now a rational proof of the strongest rational proofs, intellectually, you're compelled to accept this. Meaning, this proof is so strong rationally, the human rationale, the human intellect, is forced to accept this argument necessarily. Meaning, yaqeenan if you use a rational, logical standard. Because it's true. The premises are true. Things don't pop into existence. Right? Now, the scale is balanced, being, non-being. Something has to come to tilt the scale to being. Right? Now, if that, not, if, if that contingent thing is, pre is, is relies on something else. So someone made this microphone. Right? Oh, let's say all the parts of this microphone. Someone made it. Oh, who made that person? Who made that person? So if a contingent thing relies... Oh, yes. <laughs> so, if a contingent thing relies on another contingent thing, fine. But that contingent thing needs to rely on another contingent thing. Are you with me? Because it can't bring itself into being. It needs something else to bring it into being. That thing can either be contingent or something else, which we'll, you know, which we'll look at now. But let's assume it's a contingent being. So let's assume, you know, this is actually a really good example. A man who's standing. For him to stand, he needs to lean on someone. Are you with me? For him to stand, he can't stand by himself. He needs to, he needs to, 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 to stay standing. He, she needs to lean on someone. They need to lean on someone as well, because they're contingent too. They have to, and like that, everyone is keeping standing, existing, quote-unquote, existing, existing, with this metaphor of standing, right? And there's a huge domino of people leaning on one another like that. Now, what if it continues indefinitely? What if this contingency continues indefinitely, and there's an indefinite line of people leaning on someone else. If there's an indefinite, infinite 
contingent chain. Will the first one exist? No. Because the chain doesn't end. It's still characterized by contingency. The last person has to be what? Standing firm and leaning on something. Or leaning on a rock. Or leaning on something that exists by it. By itself. Because otherwise the chain would not exist. The first man would, if it's an infinite regress of contingent possible beings, it won't exist. The fact that it exists tells me that at the end of the chain, there is a being who's not contingent. There's a being whose being is wajib. It's necessary. They're the source of their own being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of his very special sifat attributes is wajibul wujud. Allah ta'ala is a necessary existence. In no way contingent. That means no space, no time, no change. It means many things. But if I don't premise rationally a wajibul wujud at the end of the chain, what I see and I know exists cannot exist. It's merely an illusion. Because the contingency doesn't end. Do you see that? It's only contingent, meaning it's not, it's not real. It hasn't formed into existence. So this is actually one of the most powerful arguments rationally for the, uh, for the um, certainty uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. It's a rational argument and the intellect is compelled to accept it. Uh, the idea of being which we all know exists and contingent being which we all know is contingent we have to premise at the beginning of that chain a necessary being wajibul wujud. And this is one, as I said, one of the most powerful arguments that the ulama developed. Now, there are other arguments, but we live in a contingent world of time, and time is moving very quickly. There's the cosmological argument. Basically, the universe, it has been proven in science, had a cause. Uh, Scientists cannot hide behind the fact that the universe could be eternal. The Big Bang has been affirmed scientifically. The universe was expanding. Because it's expanding, it goes back to a finite point. That point must have a cause. Because everything in the universe has a cause. And we know that rationally, intuitively, it is axiomatic. No scientist can say, this doesn't have a cause, it just is. No one can say that. Right? And so that universe must have a cause. What made the universe? And you have to, again, you must, you're compelled rationally to premise that there was the beginning of the cause, but the universe was the beginning of space and time. That cause has to be beyond space and beyond time. It has to be. And even if you proved something beyond the finite singularity, that must have a cause. And that cause is the cause of space and time, and the cause of everything that happens. Then there's the fine-tuning argument, which I'm trying to appreciate experientially, because I'm not a scientist in any way, shape, or form. Uh, my last contact with science was probably grade 12 or 13. But the universe operates what's called, you know, in quantities and constants. These are the you know, the, the constants that govern the universe, like the gravitational constants, like the weak forces and the strong forces, these uh, mathematical, physical const uh, constants in physics, I guess you'd say physical constants, I suppose, they govern the universe to make life possible. Right? And what they found is that these constants like, for example, the gravitational constant, right? It is so finely tuned, right? The gravitational is so finely tuned to such an astronomical degree of precision that the slightest, most minuscule, most astronomical change 
would make the universe life prohibiting. So for example, the gravitational constant, if it varied in 1 to the 10 of 60, right? 1 to the 10 of 60 is like point 60 zeros. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something, right? Point zero 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 and I'm only at thirty. Add thirty more and then put a one. So point sixty zero is one. If it changed the slightest life would not exist. That proves um, there's a designer. It's so finely tuned. It proves that there is a designer. And I was watching, though it's to a certain extent not relevant for, for my life, but I was watching Richard Dawkins. And he says, you know, in his own estimation, he says, if this is the argument for God, if this, if there is an argument for God's existence, this is it. And yes, I could be a deist. But then you'd have to prove to me, you know, Isa alayhi salam and, and other things about Christianity and Islam, which I'm not interested in. But the idea of a God, he goes, if there is an argument, this is it. Because he realizes, actually, and he realizes probably a lot more uh, than he gives off, or he's not realizing enough, that this is, this is compelling for the scientist, compelling to prove there's an incredible astronomical level of fine-tuning in the universe and that it simply cannot have come by chance. Inna kulla shay'in khalaqnahu bi qadar. We have created everything in proportion. Subhana. Inna kulla shay'in khalaqnahu bi qadar. Everything is created with the most delicate, the most fine, the most perfect proportion. Let's look at the spiritual proofs. We'll, we'll skip uh, the mathematical proof. So, what do the ulama now of the heart say? One of them says, Ibn Ata'illah. So with your permission, we'll do this. I, I really feel we need to cover some of these spiritual proofs and not gloss over them. So those of you, if we need to finish, let's say, 10 minutes, with your permission, I do that after Maghrib. Is that okay? And then we can delay questions after that, perhaps, if you like. But if there's anything to... Because there, there are aspects of this that are very practical, important, like how do I build Yaqeen? So we have to cover that. But I don't want to skip some of these uh, very powerful spiritual proofs. So, he says, and he was an alim, Ibn Atayla, he was an alim, a proper scholar, and a proper man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of inshallah the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, in his hikam, in his spiritual wisdoms. He says, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about, he says, Abaha laka an tandura ma fil mukawwanat. Allah ta'ala has allowed you to look and contemplate. Uh, what is in creation? So you have to follow me now. Allah has permitted you to gaze upon what is in creation. ما في المكونات وما أذن لك أن تقف مع ذوات المكونات. But Allah did not allow you to stop your gaze at them, at created things. Then he says, he quotes an ayah from the Qur'an. قُلِ انظُرُوا مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ Allah says, say, ponder what is in the heavens. And then he says, subhana, uh, then he says, Ibn Atayla, فَتَحَ لَكَ Allah has opened for you بَابَ الْإِفْهَامِ Allah Ta'ala has opened for you the door of understandings because he did not say, وَلَمْ يَقُلْ Allah didn't say, انظروا السَّمَاوَاتِ Look at them. He said, look through them. He didn't say, look at them. Because if Allah said, 
look at them because if you looked at them it would only point to you to the existence of their forms do you see that? what's he saying? what's he saying? it's very beautiful it's Allahu Akbar so rational so meaningful so moving Basically, yes. What they're made, they're made, uh, they're created, they're contingent. What is the necessary being who made them, and what are his attributes? Look through them, see through them the attributes of the maker. Someone makes a painting. Right? You look at the painting. And what you're seeing in the painting or the work of art is what? You also see the attributes of, of the painter. What he must be like. Or even a mathematical equation. You know, you're looking at the mind in some way, the way in which they did the equation or they solved the problem. Something about the, you know, the inventor or the discoverer. In this case, this portrait, this art of existence, what does it show you, that thing, that thing, that thing? What does it show you of the maker's nature? Names, attributes, beauty, majesty, limitless, infinite. al khaliq Al-Musawwir, the designer. Al-Mubdi'ah, the originator. al Al Basit, the expander, Al Wasir, look at the ocean, Al Wasir, the infinitely expansive. Right? And and and. So he says Allah Ta'ala is telling us to look through them, not to stop at matter, not to stop at the form to see beyond the forms. He says in another hikam. He says, Al Haqku Laysa bi Mahjubin. Allah Ta'ala is Al-Haq. Allah of His names, Subhana. Al-Haq is what? The reality. The truth. But the reality. The reality. What is really real? Is a contingent thing real in itself? Is a contingent thing real in itself? Why not? It needs something else to make it exist. It it's not real in itself. It is real. It exists. But it's not inherently real. It needs something else to make it be. If that thing was not there, it would not be. It's dependent. Antumul fuqara. You are needy for Allah Azza wa Jal. You need Allah. Every, every atom and subatomic particle needs Allah Azza wa Jal to be. Without his Mashia, it would not be. Nothing would be. I would not be. My abilities would not be. My body, my mind, my feelings would not be if he was not. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Al Haqqu, the reality, the truth, Laysa bi Mahjub, the truth is not veiled from you. Al-Haqqu laysa bi mahjub. Allah is not hidden from you. Wa innama al-mahjubu anta an nazari ilayhi. You are veiled from properly seeing him. You are veiled. Al-mahjubu anta an nazari ilayhi. Why? Because idh lo hajabahu shay'un if anything veiled him, if you say Allah is veiled, where is God? Right? Where is God? You know, does God exist? You know, show me. If you say Allah is veiled, if anything veils him, if lo hajabahu if anything veils him, la setarahu ma hajabahu. If anything veils him, then that which veils him would cover him. Does that make sense? Would cover him. 
ولو كان له ساتر لكان لوجوده حاصر and if something covered him it would restrict his being because what it covers you something covers you it it limits you حاصر it limits you in some way وَكُلُّ حَاصِرٍ لِشَيْءٍ فَهُوَ لَهُ قَاهِرٍ And everything that limits you has power over you. وَهُوَ الْقَاهِرُ فَوْقَ عِبَادِ He quotes the ayah. But he is the overwhelming power over everything. Did you follow the argument? He has power to limit everything. He is Allah. Nothing can limit him. If you say, where is he? You're saying he's covered, he's veiled. If you say that, it has limited him. That can't be God. Allah must be what name of his? To be Allah. You should know. Allah must be al-zahir. By, by virtue of being Allah. Al-zahir, the apparent. The obvious. He must be. Because nothing, think about it rationally now, and Allah knows what some of his ibad, some of the great awliya ulama, what they know experientially of this. But rationally, because how can he be limited by anything? How can he be veiled by anything? How can he not be so obvious? Because anything that veils him limits him. That which limits him has power over him. Subhana. So he is a zahir. If he is a zahir, then what's the question? The fact that I can't see him, what does that mean? I can't see him. The fault is me. The fault is my eye, the eye of my heart. If the eye has a disease and can't see, we don't blame the knowables. We blame the eye. And if the eye can't see, we fix the, we fix the eye. We don't deny the knowables. That's irrational. If you, if you define God as he must be defined, you have to define him, subhana, as al-zahir, meaning he is fully manifest. The next question, which is the more important one, is why can't I see? Why can't I see? That's the question we should be asking, not does God exist. Now, what's wrong with me? Why can't I see God? If God is God, and we define him as God, and I think everyone would, then these flow almost compellingly. Something that's a bit more, a bit more, uh, uh, say, sophisticated. Anyway, we'll just do maybe three or four of them, inshallah. How can it be conceived that something veils him? Now he's, now, he's, now he's in full force to explain this concept of Allah's uh, zahiriyyah, quote-unquote, Allah's manifestness. He says, how can it be conceived that something veils him when he is the one who manifests it? Meaning he's the one who creates it in the first place. How can it be conceived that something veils him when he is the one who is manifest through everything, meaning everything in creation manifests that he made it, because it's, as we know now, it's contingent. So how can anything veil him when he is the one who is manifest through the nature of everything? The nature is saying, I didn't make myself. I was made. If things could speak, if things could speak, they would be saying what? La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. That's what everything would be saying. I didn't make myself. I was made. And everything is pointing to him. How can it be conceived that something veils him when he is the one who is manifest in everything? Meaning that everything is a manifestation of his names and attributes. How can it be conceived that something veils him when he is manifest to everything, everything knows him as and is in praise and tasbih of him. Alam tara anna Allah yusabbihu lahu ma fi s-samawati wal-ard wal-tayru safat 
Don't you see? Alam tara, don't you know, don't you see that everything is in tasbih of him in the heavens and the earth? So how can he be how can he be concealed when everything recognizes him and is manifesting his existence through praise? How can he be conceived that something veils him when he was the manifest before the existence of anything? And he continues and continues and continues with this line of spiritual rational argument that other commentators who came later, uh, like Ibn Abbad, would say if this was the only hikam in his work, that's enough. Because he makes you, I think it was Ibn Abbad, another commentator on the hikam, famous alim as well, who said that he brings you through this to yaqeen. That in this spiritual, rational language, he takes you to yaqeen. Uh, it's just very beautiful, very beautiful hikmah that deserves probably um, a lot more study uh, and, and pondering, most importantly. And the last hikmah for us, uh, if the light of certainty would shine from you, if my qalb would light up and illuminate with the light of certainty, you would see the hereafter so near that you would not have to go to it. If the light of yaqeen manifests in your heart, and you had that yaqeen, and it manifested with this nur of yaqeen, like yaqeen is a nur, nur allows you to do what? To see that which you couldn't see before. So suddenly, this nur of yaqeen, like a sun of yaqeen, dawns, you could say, in your heart, and it, it lights up with this special light, not regular light, special light, not even, you know, Gamma rays, beyond rays, spiritual rays. They illuminate reality such that you would see the hereafter so near. Min an tan tarhala ilayha. You don't have to even go to it. It's so close. Are you with me? Because going to something means it's far away. Right? It's distant. And then he says, وَلَرَأَيْتَ مَحَاسِنَ dunya, And you would see the beauties of the world those things that are contingent and needy. But because we don't have that sight of yaqeen, we see them as real and certain and permanent. وَلَرَأَيْتَ مَحَاسِنَ dunya, You would see all the beauties, all mahasin dunya, it's am, all the beauties of dunya that I find beautiful, all of them. وَقَدْ ظَهَرَتْ كِثْفَةُ الْفَنَاءِ عَلَيْهَا Suddenly, with that light of yaqeen, everything that is beautiful in the dunya is now clothed and, and eclipsed in extinction. Because I would see it as needy, contingent, doesn't subsist by itself. It's not permanent. It's fleeting. It's only there because he willed it to be. I would see every beauty in the world cloaked in an eclipse of extinction. So those are some of the of the hikam. What do you think? Beautiful, aren't they? You know, imagine, you know, from from what gives one iman as a student of ilm is to see the likes of this from our ulama. To see this is who they were. This is who Allah chose to protect His deen the likes of Imam al-Razi and the likes of this alim, Rabbani, Ibn Ata'illah. This gives you yaqeen. When you see them and when you live with them, uh, and if Allah gives us a chance to interact with some of his special ibad, our teachers, that develops one of the most powerful ways of yaqeen. One of the most powerful ways of yaqeen in Allah and in his Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, Simply this, we discussed it, the source of yaqeen is the qalb, the heart, right? Uh, because he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that in the body, inna fil jasadi mudra, in the body there is a, 
piece of flesh, let's say an entity. There is an entity. إذا صلحت, if it's good, صلح الجسد كله. All the body is good. وإذا فسدت, and if it's bad, corrupt, all the body is bad. ألا وهي القلب. That is the spiritual heart. This could not be this could not be more explicit. That everything about me is rectified when my heart is rectified, is clean, is purified, right? is uh, adorned with beautiful attributes, is purged of its ugliness and its disease. And that's why the field of Tazkiyatunnas, of purification of the nafs, has always been at the center of the Islamic sciences, in addition to the other sciences. It's always been that way, except in post-colonial times, where we've forgotten much of that, uh, for many reasons, political and otherwise. But the idea of having a healthy heart, a healthy mirror, to reflect, to see, to know, because the heart is like a mirror. Therefore, the cleaner the mirror, the stronger the reflection, the more the yaqeen. Because I see the world as it is. I see the nobles as they are. They're not inverted. The, convex the convexities, the concavities in the mirror do not distort the nobles. I see it as it is. And that's only because the mirror is cleaned. And the mirror needs to be cleaned. The qalb needs to be cleansed through tazkiyah, a process of tazkiyah, or ihsan. And because the qalb is the seat of how I know, how I feel, experience, how I will, uh, when it is not clean, purified, that is often the result of doubts, shak, and often the result of doubts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this very powerfully in the Qur'an. And of course the heart is not cleaned because of the impact of the nafs. If we had more time, we would explore this more. The, the lower self and the drives of the lower self. The ideological drives, the ahwa, and the sensual drives, the shahawat. The sensual drives, they, they suffocate the qalb when they're out of balance. Some drives must be, I'm a human. But when they're excessive, those shahawat, they suffocate the qalb. When my, when my ideological, when my philosophical ideas are in contrast with Allah's shara, that also suffocates the heart. So Allah Ta'ala says, speaking about this deeper incentive, this deeper driver, Allah Ta'ala says, فَإِذَا رَكِبُوا فِي الْفُلْكِ When they are on the ocean, sailing on the ocean, دَعَوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ When they're on the sea, they're calling upon Allah with sincerity, utmost sincerity. Why? Why do you think psychologically human beings do that? You're on the sea. You know, it's not like taking a, a yacht, just you know, sailing along the shore. You're in the midst of the sea. There is no land. There's only horizon everywhere you look. And you very vulnerable and you're very scared even the season of them and at any time the winds could come the uh, waves could shift the currents could take you it's very very god inspiring to be on the sea in the sense especially in those days right so now they're calling mukhlisin alahuddin they're in complete ikhlas فَلَمَّا نَجَاهُمْ Then Allah saves them. إِلَى الْبَرِّ On land. إِذَا هُمْ يُشْرِكُونَ Suddenly, they reject him. لِيَكْفُرُوا بِمَا آتَيْنَاهُمْ وَلِيَتَمَتَّعُوا فَسَوْفَ يَعْلَمُونَ Of the ulama that saw this, uh, some of my teachers, حَفِظُهُمُ الله, that conveyed it to us, that other ulama actually didn't see even. Allah Ta'ala gave them a barakah in terms of this because the Qur'an is limitless. Why do they suddenly reject him when they get to land? لِيَكْفُرُوا So that in order that they can reject 
what he gave them. So what Allah gave them, now they can use their atheism to say, he didn't give me this. And why would I want to do that? Why would I want to reject and not acknowledge what Allah gave me? So I can continue to enjoy life in the way that I want. Because I want to lead a life of sin. I want to leave a, lead a life of freedom of my lower self. I don't want to acknowledge I've got a responsibility to be grateful to Allah. I don't want to acknowledge God gave me that. God gave me that. God gave me that. I don't want to do that. And I don't want to feel guilty when I sin. When I disobey Him and I know it's wrong, I don't want to feel guilty and then have to say, Astaghfirullah. I want to just continue living the life I want. And so when I'm on the sea and I'm fearful and afraid and very aware of my neediness and poverty and indigence, I'm a great slave. And when I get to land, لِيَكْفُرُوا Now, in order, I reject Allah in order to be ungrateful. وَلِيَتَمَتَّعُوا And in order to continue to enjoy without having any moral responsibility or accountability. And that's very powerful psychological dimension of atheism. Uh, maybe there are some atheists that are genuine rational atheists. And if they are and they're seekers of truth, Allah will guide them. Allah will always guide one who has sincerity. If someone has sidq with Allah, even though they're not Muslim, Allah will guide them. For sure. But many are simply atheists in this sense. There's no reason. There's no true reason. It's just this. I want to live this style of life. And I don't want to be encumbered by this thing uh, that I have to acknowledge called the divine. And then I have to live in the way the divine wants. And I have to give up all of my privileges, give up all of my pleasures. I don't want to do that. And so I reject him. And that very powerfully in this ayah is conveyed. So how is Yaqeen lost? Alhamdulillah, we seem to have time. Did the go? It's going to happen. Okay. Uh, let's continue until the adhan, uh, adhan is called. Unless, if you have, shall we stop? Okay. How is your clean lost? Now you know one way. Practically, what did we say? Any Anytime I disobey Allah Ta'ala. Anytime Allah says, do something and I don't. Anytime Allah Ta'ala says, don't do something and I do. Right? Anytime that happens, I'm affecting the equilibrium, transparency of my qalb, of my heart. And then I'm not going to be able to see properly, or feel properly, or will properly. Right? Uh, Allah Ta'ala says, this rust has covered their hearts based on what they used to do to work. On that day, they will be veiled from their Lord. That day, that day, the hereafter, but it could be that day, these days. I keep keep doing what is wrong till my heart gets covered, and on that day, that appointed day in this world, I'm now veiled from Allah. And when I'm veiled from Allah, what do I express? Huh, there is no God. Where is this God? You know, my family was Muslim. They made me Muslim. I started to doubt. I'm a free thinker. I started to use logic. I started to interrogate, you know, my culture, my traditions that chained me, uh, you know, uh, and they, they constricted me and I wanted to be free. And I met other people and they told me to be free. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All talk, 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 talk. In reality, this is what it is. Disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many times that caused that. We we'll stop there inshallah. We continue inshallah. Uh, I think we ended at the ways that yaqeen is lost. And we said very importantly, practically speaking, 
for me, dhunub, disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as one of the principal ways in which my heart is clouded and covered, and then I'm not able to see truths and realities and haqaiq, I'm not able to experience them emotionally, I have no access to them with my emotional faculties, and then I don't seek them, and then I may end up justifying that state that I led myself into. Number two, uh, real and virtual sahba. Real sahba and virtual sahba. I think we may have spoken about that before, perhaps uh, in Jumu'ah today. The powerful effects of fellowship, of companionship, of sahba that we know through the texts of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that we know through behavioral psychology, socialization, we know that as a truth of development, of personal development uh, and of personal change, that the people that we are with, we will absorb their values, we will absorb their way of life, we will absorb their deen in a matter of time, and only a matter of time. None of us are immune in that sense to the impacts on others. Uh, texts of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam are prolific on this issue. Al-mar'u ma'a man ahab. Someone, a human person, is with the one they love. With. With. With in the akhirah. We will end up with them in the akhirah. If we love Fir'aun, if we love his like, his ilk, we will be with them, indeed, in the Akhirah, وَلِعِيَادُ billah, And we will be with them in dunya, not only physically, but with them, meaning we'll be uh, their allies. We'll have a solidarity, intellectual solidarity with them, emotional solidarity, a mental union with them, we'll think like them, we'll frame the way in which we see life as they frame their lives. We are with them because of the powerful impact of hub, love, of that, attach, uh, that attachment uh, and that, uh, uh, that connection we have with them. And so one of the ways in which I may lose uh, my yaqeen or may lose even my iman, wal-iyadu billah, is constant exposure to not rational argumentation but doubts, shubuhat specious arguments in the guise of good arguments. Uh, how, how many b- bad arguments are there clothed in what seems to be, you know, truth? Uh, most human beings, do most hum- human beings think clearly? No. Most human beings do not think clearly. Very few human beings actually think clearly. And so when we expose ourselves to that sea of public opinion, and everyone has an opinion, especially online, and everyone is so quick to draw their guns like a gunslinger and give their opinion on every single issue, we are going to be affected if we keep hearing that, and we interact with that, and we fill our time, and it will begin to inundate our consciousness, and all of those specious arguments will take form in our minds and will affect us. And so part of uh, maintaining our yaqeen is to uh, be careful of what we allow into the gates of our heart, our minds, our eyes, our ears, our tongue, our hands, in terms of what we do, what we write, our feet, where we go, and so forth. And uh, lastly, simply the law of entropy, in the sense that the mere passage of time if we are not making an effort commensurate with the forces against us, we're going to be losing the battle. Right? In order to repel, repel the negative energies and the messaging and propaganda and, um, and public relations campaigning against Deen and the values and constants of Deen, <laughs> To do that, I must be making an equal and opposite energy, positively speaking, by way of ilm, beneficial knowledge, not just any ilm, but ilm nafi'ah, not any ilm in deen is beneficial. Uh, ilm can be junk ilm for me, 
it doesn't help me in my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It only might increase me in, in uh, stubbornness and in arrogance. But beneficial ilm is an energy, positive spiritual energy that fills me up with potential energy to obey Allah ta'ala. Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abundance in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making that a, a regular habit, mental and heartfelt habit of mine to be in Allah Ta'ala's remembrance. Dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, regular diet of dua, uh, connecting in sahba with Rasulullah Sallallahu Ta'ala Alayhi Wa Ali Wa Sallam in salawat. Salawat is sahba because he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hears, it knows, is informed of that and he responds to me. So I'm an, I, I'm in a sahba with him. Sahba ma'anawiya. A sahba of meaning. Only Allah knows what that would be in the beyond realm. Of course now, as Muslims, the density of matter, we might balk at that. Well, the one who created the laws of life created the laws of death. And the one who makes the living here makes those who we think are dead here. And the one who makes the living respond makes the dead, quote-unquote, respond. And death is anything, nothing except a journey into another realm. So to be in sahba with Allah in dhikr, to be in sahba with Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam in salawat, to be in muraqaba, to be aware of Allah watching me regularly, constantly. Allah's gaze upon my heart, Allah's gaze upon my mind, Allah's gaze upon my words. And who is Allah in His infinite beauty and majesty? Subhanahu. And to feel that and to get used to that and to begin to, alhamdulillah, screen and filter what I allow into my mind and heart to be the doorman, the doorwoman, the soldier at the gate of my heart. To not allow in of feelings, of emotions, of ideas, anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love, to be the security guard, that should be my full-time vocation. And part-time engineer, full-time doorman of my heart, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, foot soldier for Allah to protect my heart, and maybe Allah ta'ala will then increase my rank and grade, if He, would, if he loves, if He wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, those would be some of the means and ways of developing yaqeen practically. Essentially, as you would have realized, Hafidhukumullah, the field of tazkiyatun nafs. All of what I'm mentioning is really in the realm and field of what we know to be purification of the nafs, that science that the ulama, our deen, has spoken about extensively and that always was umbilically related to ilm uh, and the rational sciences. Uh, amal. Actually, the ulama, when they speak about yaqeen, they speak about amal develops yaqeen, ibadah develops yaqeen. That makes perfect sense, right? Because as I am involved in quality ibadah, my heart is cleansing. When my heart is cleansing, I'm developing yaqeen. Salah as probably one of the most powerful cleansers of the qalb. When I'm in salah and with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that intimate discourse with Allah, intimate communion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I, am, uh, I am in the divine presence and I'm drawing from, if you like, the light of the divine presence subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that has an effect on my qalb and it has an effect on my yaqeen. That sense of Allah ta'ala's watchfulness, I take outside of salah. That concentrated uh, communion with Allah Ta'ala and the energies I meant to attain that then uh, allows me to survive and to insulate myself from the negative pressures around me and inside of me until the next salah in which I recharge and re-nourish myself and reconnect with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala through another quality salah and so the cycle of cleansing continues through the most beautiful ibadah and mi'raj of salah. Every salah is a mi'raj of my heart to the upper realms 
with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it's meant to be. As-salatu mi'arajul mu'min, the ulama say. So those would be, hafizhukumullah, some of the ways in which, practically speaking, we can um, develop yaqeen, uh, we can safeguard ourselves, we can protect those divine values that we are meant to uphold, that we can also assist our uh, beloved near and dear ones, our children, our wives, our husbands, to be able to, alhamdulillah, hold on to the constants, the constants, the unchangeable constants of our deen. What we're speaking about here, Allah and the integrals of faith and Islam, they're not variables. Our deen has variables. Uh, our deen has aspects that change, that must change to preserve welfare. But the deen also has constants. We must never compromise constants. Uh, with that, inshallah, I will take uh, your permission uh, to close the very brief summary of the longer applied learning seminar about God is the spiritual and rational proofs for his existence. Uh, with your indulgence for five minutes, I would like to simply share a very brief presentation about the Sahba Seminary, and then, inshallah, uh, we can open up the floor for your reflections, uh, comments, and, uh, and even questions, inshallah. So the seminary, in a few minutes, inshallah. Um, the seminary is the... Um, actually, let me just say this. The seminary is sort of the final, the final um, fruit, if you like, of the Sahba Fellowship Program in person with Sheikh Mukhtar Maghrawi, which ran for three years in Istanbul, in person. One year, and then we renewed it for another year, and renewed it for another year. And in that Sahba, the emphasis was on ilm, on learning, beneficial ilm, on practicing what we learned, on developing and reforming our akhlaq and uh, of learning by fellowship with our teacher and with one another. And then when COVID came, the program was transformed into an online program as a sort of an experiment. Can we do it? And alhamdulillah, it was very successful. And so we had a first class of Sahba online, class one. And then we added, we had many students, Sahba online two. And currently we have essentially one and two. And then we decided um, just a few months ago to launch a seminary, a five-year program that would, inshallah, combine both online sahba with in-person sahba in Istanbul from time to time during the year for those who would like to experience that. Uh, the seminary was the dream of Sheikh Mukhtar for 20 years uh, before uh, this uh, Fakir went to study in Cape Town, uh, South Africa. Um, uh, we were reminded to think about our own institute that teaches within the envelope of Tazkiyah to Nafs with an emphasis on Akhlaq and an emphasis, and an emphasis on uniting the rational and spiritual sciences. So 20 years later, uh, it appears that uh, Sheikh Mukhtar would like very much to launch that. So this was a dream for 20 years, and what follows is merely uh, a brief exposition of what the seminary is. So I think you would know most of this anyway with that introduction. What is it? An institute of higher learning, uh, essentially three purposes, you could say, to anchor every Muslim in Islam's spiritual and rational legacy. Number two, equip them with the knowledge and skills to safely navigate the challenges of modernity meaning practically the challenges of our age. We, we learn not to learn. We learn to change, to become. We learn not to learn uh, as an academic exercise. We learn to apply and project what we learn on life. And third, to ensure that whatever we learn, we practice. Uh, that whatever we learn, we do. And that Islam is not, as you know, about being. Islam is about becoming. Why? Because the knowledge we learn must give me an experiential, emotional connection 
of love, of hope, of fear, of longing with Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Knowledge must not be dry and hollow and brittle. It must produce an experiential relationship with Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It must transform and reform my akhlaq. Because my akhlaq, the way that my heart, my qalb is in reality, its inner face faces, akhlaq is the touchstone of my Muslimness and my spirituality. Tasawwuf or tazkiyah is all about akhlaq. If I don't have akhlaq, uh, no matter what I say, I am not on the path of tazkiyah to nafs. And to live a life, inshallah, with our own principles of what is true freedom. And incidentally, a much greater, wider experience of what freedom is and what happiness is. Who is a student? You are. Uh, the program was structured in such a way to be very flexible and customizable. So anything from, if you want, four hours a month, that's it by one of these learning seminars, which we, we, we would offer, inshallah, once a month. If that's all that you wish to do for four hours, so be it. Up to six or seven hours a week. And what's in between? One could do an hour and a half, one course. One could do three hours at an advanced elective. You could do the learning and fellowship class, which is a practical class that adds another hour and a half any or all of the above. What does the graduate look like? Well, would have a high spirituality quotient, SQ. Inshallah, a high IQ, but the IQ falls within the SQ, uh, meaning to be spiritually aware and sensitive. Would have a refined character. This would be a good student, uh, a serious good student. Inshallah, refined akhlaq, practices what he or she knows, and is able to navigate and travel through modern life and the challenges of modern life with a compass. And that compass is a dual compass. It has a rational face to it and a spiritual face as well. Uh, who is our founder and mentor? Shaykhuna Mukhtar Maghrawi, um, who um, we've been learning now with for many, many years. Uh, he is, as you know, I think just as a kind of an um, some data. Uh, who does not know Sheikh Mukhtar? Okay, that's interesting. Uh, that's good to know. So Sheikh Mukhtar is um, uh, he's he's uh, he was born in Algeria, lived most of his life in the United States. Uh, I met him about twenty plus years ago. Uh, he's a scholar that's very well versed in the Islamic sciences, in all of them. Uh, he's an astrophysicist. Uh, he's got his PhD in electrical engineering. I have his transcripts. Uh, uh, they're all, they're all, uh, you know, A, A's, A pluses. I graduated magna cum laude in in physics, uh, probably out of the ulama that I have uh, been very blessed to meet and study with. Uh, many of them, uh, I would say, probably the most gifted, both spiritually and rationally, and a lot of experience in mentoring, learning, practicing, counseling. Um, he was the imam in upstate New York and then Plano and Florida. He's now in Istanbul. How do we realize our vision? Four components, ilm, knowledge, practice, amal, fellowship, sahba, and applied learning. So knowledge is essentially eight modules. Each has core courses and advanced electives and specialized studies only for Arabic students. Uh, we have the element of practice to practice what we learn gradually and slowly together over the course of the year, the importance of fellowship, I said both online and in person, and applied learning. This is an applied learning seminar. We have 32 of them that are meant to project what we learn on the issues of the day. The example of study streams, just be very brief, one can be a self-paced student at your own pace. You could choose the ijaza route or a certificate route by doing the core courses, or you could do more. Uh, and do the advanced electives and be an honor student. Uh, here's an example of, okay, so here are the eight modules that are, are offered throughout the year in five weeks, uh, in five week um, 
I guess, uh, modules. Tazkiyat al-Nafs, legal theory and objectives of the law, usul al-fiqh and maqasid, but with a practical emphasis to learn the aspects, well, to learn usul al-fiqh, to appreciate our scholarship, and then to learn it by learning aspects, rational aspects, of the objectives of the law and axioms of the law to apply in life. And the way we teach that module is by case studies that deal with issues in life. Ahmed got a scholarship to uh, do football at an American university and he wants to join the NFL. Should he do that? He's young. He's impressionable. He's somewhat practicing Islamically. The program at the university is primarily football focused. He wants to do academics, but perhaps most of his time will be devoted towards football. He wants to get into the NFL. So now, after you've learned aspects of usul al-fiqh and maqasid, how would you think through this rationally as mom or dad? And then we have other, you know, 12 or 13 case studies, but to teach it in that way. The reality of the realities of Rasulullah, his special, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, his special maqam, Quran, tafsir, aqidah, hadith, fiqh, politics, culture, and history. Here's an example of tazkiyah, what it looks like in those five years. You'll see that year one, introduction. Year two, at the core courses, uh, more advanced studies. Year three, the spiritual wisdoms of Ibn Atta'illah. Year four, the heart's diseases and cures. Year five, the topic of yaqeen and the graces of calamity. At the advanced electives level, which is optional, you can see that it gets even deeper into subjects like spiritual mindfulness, like the words and poetry of Islam scholar saints, the evolution of spirituality, the spirituality of the Salaf, and lastly, contentious issues in spirituality. Uh, an example in hadith, which I won't do, it's more technical as a science, but basically everything, I would say this, everything that you would learn in an ac academic program, in a postgraduate study of serious Islamic studies, almost all subjects are included in one way or another here. Uh, and so the, inshallah, the intent is the ilm is very serious and very broad and very deep. Uh, in hadith studies, we'll be looking at Orientalism. For those who wish, you don't have to. Uh, the, methodologies of, the methodologies of the muhaddithun, if, if that interests you. And at the core level, essentially everything you need to know foundationally as a Muslim by way of Islamic ilm. Uh, fellowship, as I said briefly, is in line and, and also in person. Um, we will be allowing and welcoming students to come and visit it's, uh, some of the modules of the year, to spend some time in Istanbul and attend classes and attend the dhikr circles, and to travel, inshallah, with us uh, and to uh, see the history of, of that beautiful, uh, beautiful city. Um, the um, applied learning seminars, uh, there's eight themes, um, and we have 32 of them that fill in these themes, growth and productivity, setting the record straight, which is this one, this one falls under that theme, it's about the existence of God, family and youth, education and history, society and technology, art and aesthetics, yes, poetry, for example, and art, uh, what happened to the Islam in Mulana Rumi? for example, is one of the courses. The erasure of Islam in Rumi's poetry. Why? How did it happen? Activism and politics, yes, and travel and nature. Here's an example of, for example, um, just setting the record straight. Uh, these are the seven courses in that uh, theme. New Age Spiritualism or Spirituality. Uh, the polemics against Rasulullah and their responses. The idea of the Kharijite mentality. What is it and why is it so dangerous? Perennialism, a critique of perennialism. Um, God is the place of the weak hadith in Islam, a very systematic study of that. And the idea of bid'ah, for example, under setting the record straight. Um, in terms of amal, uh, we would have a class, fellowship and practice, in which we would learn together to incorporate a daily routine of ibadah, step by step by step, so that over the course of the year, I can build up a habit of, let's say, morning and evening at car, and we learn to practice that together. 
at car after salah, dua, for example, regular dua, acts of service, that's part of the wird, giving sadaqah, part of the wird. So a regular program of ibadah. We also have what's called sitting still sessions, where we learn to sit still in ibadah, and learn to still our minds, our bodies, and to focus our hearts and minds in ibadah. If you like guided meditation, uh, properly defined. And then a remembrance with Sheikh Mukhtar every week. Uh, those are some of the teachers. And Sheikh Mukhtar is the, is the senior founder and teacher. And that's it. Jazakumullahu khairan. If you want any information, um, we have the prospectus available. I guess you would say prospecti. Uh, and, um, and, the, and the flyers. Uh, forgive me. Now your questions, whether on this topic or whether on um, the topic of uh, the existence of, of the divine. Bismillah. Can you use this one? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Very good. So, uh, <coughs> you know, I, I would say with our call of prayer, you say that there are witnesses that you know, there is no God but Allah. And you bear witness that. So, so bearing witness is, you know, you've got to be physically present sometimes. You know, that's how you can be a witness to something. But I guess it all comes down to yaqeen. That you have yaqeen in the line. That's how you're bearing witness without seeing it. And bearing witness to the Prophet. So is there any other thought that you can share? Yes. Jazakumullah khairan. The idea of shahada. So, even before the adhan, the kalima of shahada, the, you know, the word of testimony, is la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah. We call that the shahada, or to testify. Right? Literally, to testify. Shahada yushahidu means to see, to observe, to testify to something. And yes, we use that in the physical sense. Like a mushahid is an eyewitness. Right? Uh, a shahada is also a witness that you have, let's say, graduated. You get a shahada. Meaning someone, now in a more metaphorical sense, witnesses or testifies that you are competent. So you get a shahada, a certificate. That's also, you know, uh, linguistically in Arabic allowed, a certificate. The idea of affirming, affirming. So it has this material dimension, but it also has an intellectual dimension in the case of a certificate. You know, those, uh, the ones who issued the certificate didn't watch me take the exam, all of them, watch me study, watch me get, you know, they testified in that sense that yes, I've passed the exams and I'm eligible to be an engineer, for example. It also has a spiritual meaning of testify. The spiritual meaning is I'm testifying with my heart. Yes, my mind, intellectually, but my heart. My heart testifies. And when the heart testifies, it's like the heart is seen, quote-unquote, in the way the heart can see. Like when you I see the truth. What does that mean? I see the truth. Yeah, I see it. Means I, I witness it. I know it. I'm certain of it. Not that I see it with necessarily my eyes. So this idea of shahada at an intellectual level, shahada at a spiritual level. So when we sp speak about shahada in the ultimate level, it's my heart sees the truth of a noble. It sees it. It knows it. Meaning, it knows it with yaqeen. And there are different levels of knowing, the ulama will say, the different ilm. You know, there's a type of ilm when I know something by description. The example they like to give is honey. Let's say I've never experienced honey. And someone describes honey. That's one level of, of knowing. You describe it, and of course you can describe it very elaborately. You know, the chemical components, the viscosity, 
the liquidity, you, know, you, you, you can be very precise. But I only know it by description. That's an ilm. Secondly, you bring me honey. Now that's a ziyadah, that's an increase in my knowing. It's a different, that's now, now I'm witnessing it with my eyes. See, the first one was a mental witnessing. Now I witness it, I look at it, I, uh, I play with it, I spoon it up, I observe it, I smell it, I touch it, right? Then what do you think I do as the third level of knowledge? I taste it. I taste it. So the ulama say that like that, there's different levels of my iman corresponding to levels of increasing certainty and yaqeen. I know something, I know it. I have iman in it. But then I know it. And then I taste it. So they call it dhuq. The ulama of tasawwuf, what they call it, tazki, they call it dhuq. The heart tastes, it experiences a reality. And that experience of the reality, because the heart is also a faculty of cognition, it's a locus of cognition, of understanding, of experience, of seeing with the lens of the heart. That's a type of knowing that's very, very powerful. And that's yaqeen. So I see with my heart. And that's what the Mu'addin is saying. It's really beautiful. Where would you find this level of beauty in any deen? The Mu'addin who's calling you to Adhan, which hands down, uh, Istanbul is king, probably over the entire Muslim world. And not only that, but the every Mu'addin, Allahu Akbar. Have you been? Have you heard? Every Mu'addin is selected. May Allah bless them for his voice. And everyone is a pleasure to listen to. There is not one of them that doesn't call you, your heart emotionally, to come and pray. That's the intent. And Rasulullah chose the Mu'addin like that for a maslaha. Not just anyone gives adhan. There's a reason of who you choose to give adhan. And so he selected special people to give adhan because of the effects of what that adhan is meant to produce. Adhan is meant to make you want to go to salah, not you know, hope the Muaddin just finishes. Please, please finish. Please. No, that's the opposite effect. It's to come to Salah, to be a hujjah against the khalq. So the Muaddin, you know, from that high place, of course in the minaret, well, it's loudspeakers, but from the heavens is calling. Right? Ashhadu, don't you see? No matter what you're involved in, how engrossed you are in whatever you're doing at that moment, don't you see that only Allah is truly Al-Haq? Don't you see the veracity of Rasulullah Come, now that you saw, how can you not come to Salah? Now that you saw, you know, Shahada, how can you not come to success. Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater than everything. It's like Allah is greater, dot, dot, dot. You fill in the dot. Because it's not Allah Al-Akbar. But Allah is the greatest. Actually, Allah is greater. Dot, dot, dot. There's an ellipsis at the end of that. You fill in at that moment. You feel sad, you feel down, absorbed in this, absorbed in that. Can't feel like you can do it. Allah is greater. You fill in at that moment, what is great for you? And remember, Allah is greater. And that's how he ends. And then, of course, the mu'min, the Muslim, you just have to respond. Um, the adhan could be, we could, we could reflect on the adhan and the beauty of the adhan and the meanings of the adhan. Um, subhanallah. But at the very least, alhamdulillah, the idea of witnessing. Any of the sisters?
Okay. The right. Okay, that's a good point. Did you hear that? The fine tuning argument. I'm going to try to summarize it. You, you, um, please, please do correct me. The fine tuning argument is a very powerful argument for the existence of God, um, meaning those very fine tuned constants that govern uh, the laws and forces of the universe. So, how do we reconcile those now? These fine tuned laws that are done in a way to make life permissible and not prohibiting, how do you reconcile that with the idea of miracles, which are the breaking of natural laws? Well, um, in one way is because they are both Allah's laws. So Allah creates that law, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to suspend that law. Right? To begin with, this idea. The law by itself is a creation of Allah. They're not, they're the laws of Allah in nature. They're not the laws of nature. They're the laws of Allah in nature. And so, rationally, it is possible that the law can be suspended. There can be another law that supersedes that. That's rationally possible. Why does Allah Ta'ala do that? Because when a messenger comes, he is a human. He makes a claim. What's the claim? I speak on behalf of God. He makes a claim. It's a very serious claim. I speak on behalf of God. And he's human. Now, people might say, prove it. I mean, Anyone can make that claim. Prove it. So, the Mu'ajizah comes rationally for this. What happens? He says, okay, I'll prove to you I'm the prophet of God. I will do exactly this in this way at this time. That which is an impossibility in the natural world. And it happens exactly the way in which he says. The natural law is suspended in the way that he says. His claim, therefore, is true or false? Rationally speaking, true. And then, through the mu'ajiza, the nubuwa is established. Through the mu'ajiza, the suspension of the natural law, which can only take place by who? The creator of the natural law. And so his claim of being a representative of the divine is now established rationally by the suspension of the natural law. And that's essentially the idea of why is there a mu'ajiza that breaks natural law because of the, the logical, rational proof of the claim of prophethood by a prophet. And that's how Allah does it. To show that, yeah, he is human, but he is my representative. Because I changed laws for him in the way that he said would be done, and it came true. And therefore, it gives, it gives those who have doubts about the prophethood or messengerhood, it firms them in their faith that, yes, he does speak on behalf of God. Because that's a claim that must be tested. Other people test it in other ways. They see the akhlaq of someone. Like there were many that saw Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi face and said, that's not the face of a liar. Because of who they were, with their fitra, with their mind, with their soul. That was enough of a hujjah. He has to be a Rasul. And then the idea of prophecies as well. 
he prophesizes something that could not have been known in that detail, except if it came from someone who spoke on behalf of the divine, who has knowledge of the future. So those breaking of the natural laws, as it were, are for the purposes of, uh, of affirming Nubu and Risala. Hafidhikillah. Bismillah. How does the contingent argument uh, affect our belief in simulation theory? So specifically, if there's this chain of contingent beings, how do we know there's no contingent being between us and God? I don't know what simulation theory is. Oh, it's the theory that we are in a computer simulation. This was created by some really intelligent being, and right now we're in a computer simulation. So the question is, how do we know we're not in a creation? So even if God does exist, right, one of his creations could have created us? Even if God exists, one of his creations could have created us? How does that follow? That doesn't necessarily follow for me. In a simulation, in a computer simulation. So, but if we hypothesize a computer simulation, we can hypothesize anything. Mm -hmm. So what if? That's the question. R right. So I'm just saying that it's, how do we know we're not in a simulation? Well, because the contingency says that every contingent thing must have a non-contingent being to give it being. So how would simulation theory, for example, discount that? It, it doesn't. It wouldn't. It, it wouldn't. Uh, my question is... Okay, so, so, basically, uh, one, uh, so basically at that point, the contingency argument holds. Right. And we're looking at a necessary being that is not contingent. Okay. Right. Now the next question would be, how do we know we are in a simulation? Not in a simulation. How do we know we're not in a simulation? Well, what is a simulation? Well, you know, define a simulation. Is this, could we define existence as a simulation? Okay, so then it's a simulation. I mean, this existence, I, I think we'd have to define well, what is simulation? What do you mean by a simulation? Uh, I don't know, you know. So how about the fact, so is this understanding correct that in Islam we believe that this revelation is connected to God that we have is a direct connection? The Prophet would extend directly by God to us, which would mean that there are no intervening contingent beings between us and God. There are no, so, okay, so um, now, so the issue of simulation is a separate issue now. Now, we're not speaking about the idea of simulation, we're speaking about how do we know there are no contingent beings between us and God. But that's a different question, theoretically, than the idea of simulation, right? Except that those beings could have created us in a simulation. That was sort of the question. But, but you're right. They technically don't have to. Right. I mean, you premised uh, you know, a necessary being, the contingent theory holds. And it depends on what we mean by simulation. If we call life a simulation, yes, we're in a simulation. If you call life... Uh, you know, unless now you're saying in your definition of simulation, you, you're, 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 you're defining it in some normative way, like a matrix, like the matrix. Uh, that's a different discussion. But, you know, if you define life as a simulation, yeah, if you define it as that. Uh, but what would be definition of a simulation? So let's, let's, let's put that aside and the idea of you know, could there be a contingent being between me and God? Well, there is. I mean, I have mom and dad. They made me. You know, my existence is contingent upon, you know, the union of a man and a woman to make me. They are the quote-unquote cause of my existence, right? If we speak about cause in the scientific material sense the effective material cause of me being brought into this world, I was not brought into this world by simply the divine command, kun, 
and then I simply existed, like Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. I came through a chain of causes. They are, in that sense, quote-unquote, intermediaries always between me and God, because he has chosen to create uh, in this way through apparent cause and effect. However, however, the cause of mom and dad's union to make me was not inherent in them. They did not have the inherent power to generate me. It was a conferred power. In reality, the mover, the causer, the musabib, if you like, the causer was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he created natural laws, or for example, a union between a man and a woman to produce, uh, uh, to fertilize an egg, to make me. So I, I, do come, I, I do come into existence through a series of contingent causes. Yes. But the question is, who gives those causes their effective cause? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the idea of me being caused by contingencies, that's a given. That's operating at the dimension of science. But in the dimension of Islamic reality, aqidah, Allah is the effective cause of every causes. Ma sha Allahu kan, wa ma lam yasha lam yakun. Allah, whatever He wills, will be. Whatever He doesn't will, will not be. He willed that cause. He willed it to be like that. He willed it for me to come through procreation. He willed it for me to develop in these stages. So they are immediate causes between me and God. If we speak about the natural world, are there immediate causes between me and God in the spiritual sense? Yes. I mean, uh, I learned what is good through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Does Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa benefit me? Yes, of course he benefits me. But is he the source of benefit? No. But of course I'm benefited by Rasulullah. Yes, he benefits. Yes, he, he benefits me. Even in the Barzakh realm, he benefits me by his dua, for example. Uh, I am benefited by the immediate causes that Allah Ta'ala creates, even at the spiritual realm. Nonetheless, no Muslim would ever believe that Rasulullah is the effective, inherent power to produce the cause. No one would believe that shirk. Only Allah, only Allah has that power, has that ability. But life is, you know, you could say that these immediate causes are the laws of Allah in nature, by, you know, biologically, molecular biology, biology, physics, science, chemistry, those are all Allah's immediate causes in the natural world that He decides how things are run. But all within His will, never exiting His will, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I would say, probably that, Wallahu a'lam, Allah knows best. May Allah bless you. Okay. The best approach. <laughs> um, well, I'm stumped. The best approach? I don't know the best approach. Um, maybe some possible approaches uh, would be, well, I can say this as personal experience, um, that I found that when we study the Qur'an within a certain envelope, it produces uh, greater fruits. And the envelope of studying the Qur'an is the envelope in which everything in deen is studied, which is my experiential relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I mean by that is simply this, Allah created me, this finite, flawed human being. And Allah gave me a gift of a qalb, of a spiritual heart. And that spiritual heart was gifted to me to know the infinite. 
How miraculous is that? To know the infinite, to experience the infinite, at my human level, of course, and to love and to work to attain the love of the infinite who does not need anything. Allah Ta'ala created me to know Him and He doesn't need me and doesn't need what I do. And everything I do in relation to His infinite beauty and majesty is nothing. But yet He created me to know Him. And He says that if I grow to know Him, and if I love Him, and worship Him, and recognize Him, He will give me His hope love. The infinite hope love of the Divine. What could be a more noble quest for life? What could be the most noble purpose of existence that could compare to a relationship with infinite beauty and majesty? Now, in this life, Allah Ta'ala sends me letters of guidance. Truly love letters from the Divine, and I don't mean that in that very sheepish way. Hub <coughs> love letters from the Divine to help me grow, to help me know, to help me change, to help me realize His infinite beauty and majesty, to show me His names and attributes. And this collection of letters, uh, this collection of, of um, messages of, uh, of care and solicitude and kindness and caring, infinitely at every measure and metric, uh, teach me the context of my existence, my environment, the arkan of Iman. Teach me the map of my existence, the arkan of Islam. Teach me how to live the fiqh, the law, at the family level, at the personal level, at the sacred level, at the secular level, at the business level, all because I am meant to, in the laws and purposes and prohibitions, I am meant to connect my heart to Him more and more and more and more, and to reach, by the end of my life, the door of nearness to the Divine in this life before the next. This is the purpose of the intelligent, wise human being and the intelligent, wise Muslim. To reach the door of nearness to the Divine with my heart before Akhirah. Now, my son and daughter, that's what you were made for. That's what you were made for. You're the pearl, the pearl between both worlds, this world and the transcendent world. You're the pearl that is meant to go beyond the angelic world and the pearl that is meant to be his steward in the material world. This is the Qur'an. So understand the Qur'an and everything in it in this frame, in this context in this spiritual, uh, relational context between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Understand it as for your benefit. Allah doesn't need me. He doesn't need to give me laws because He wants me to follow them. He doesn't need the laws. He doesn't need my obedience. He doesn't need my disobedience. I harm Him nothing, whether I'm good or bad. And so when I engage with the Qur'an, I am engaging with my mind and my heart and my senses together in this context. And that's how I read the Qur'an. So I read it as you know, a miracle to me. And then as I read the Qur'an and as I study it and as I help my children to study it as a parent, I am manifesting the beautiful akhlaq that I want them to be. That is, I am, in this description, maybe, is a sort of a representation of the akhlaq the teacher or the parent needs to have with their child. That is, 
when I teach my child the Quran, I am a seeker of Allah, like him. I am on my journey, like him. And we're walking together. It's not didactic. You know, it's not instructional. You know, it's not a relationship of, of, um, of if you like, uh, rigidity. But it's a, it's, a, it's a walk, if you like, hand in hand. So in general, I would say that perhaps that might be one approach by which we would endear to our loved ones the Qur'an, so they love to read it. They love to ponder its meanings. They love, they love to dive into the seas of the Qur'an. One of my family members, uh, Hafidhullah, uh, every day she spends about probably an hour with the Qur'an, um, and she reads and she ponders and ponders and ponders. And, um, and it's such an act of love. And there's so much richness that she draws from the Qur'an in terms of meaning, of lessons that pertain to me, to my day, to my affairs, to my life. Guidance, truth. And it increases her every reading in more and more certainty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that if we approach the Qur'an with that sidq, that sincerity, uh, a sidq, sayfullahi fil ard. ما وضع على شيء إلا قطع. They say, "Sidq is Allah's sword on earth. It's not placed on anything except that it severs it, meaning that anything is possible with sincerity. So that sincerity of purpose to come to the Quran with my full mind and heart in loving submission to hear what my most loving Lord has to say to me, that will produce, inshallah, much fruit and a relationship with the Quran." Uh, that will, um, will, will animate my mind, my heart, to continue with the Qur'an. Wallahu a'lam. Just some, maybe one idea. Uh, many of you parents would probably know better, more experience. That's one way, perhaps, uh, that we can help uh, ourselves engage with the Qur'an ourselves first. I must engage with the Qur'an before I want my children to engage with the Qur'an. They must see in me uh, a love and a devotion to the Qur'an. They mustn't see in me simply someone that barks an order to do or don't. And that I'm not the example of truly someone who loves the Qur'an. And I can't fake it. I can't fake it to my child. Do read the Qur'an without me being a lover and a beloved of the Qur'an. When I'm that, then it's easy. When I'm walking the path, then Allah facilitates so much from my hands, but from Him. I become the mediating agent as an instrument of His khair for my children. But I have to be a vessel of that khair first. فَاقِدُ la yu'ti. The one who doesn't have can't give. The one who doesn't have can't give. If I don't have it, I can't dispose of it. If I don't have a love for the Qur'an, how can I give it to my children? If I don't have a love for Rasulullah how can I give it to my children? You know, the children will see through that hypocrisy, that petty hypocrisy, and it will produce a cognitive dissonance in their minds, which will confuse them even more. So I have to be the change. I have to be the change I want to see in my children. I have to be the change I want to see in my children. And then Allah gives barakah and facilitates because of sidq, sidq. The first initializing condition of any change, personal and uh, at the level of the family and broader level, is sidq. Without that initializing energy and burst of sincerity with the heart, everything is, v everything is very difficult. With it, everything is remarkably easy. Wallahu a'lam. The lower self, the lower self, the nafs, is what is necessary for life to be a test. Otherwise, we would be angels. If we didn't have a nafs, if I didn't have a nafs, I'd be an angel. I would have no internal negative drives and impulses. And then there would be no test. 
And there will be no meaning to reward and punishment. There will be no meaning to accountability. There will be no meaning to Jannah or Jahannam. So, my nafs is the field of my test. But it's also the field of my purification. See, there's this incredible duality. Allah is latif. Allah Ta'ala is subtle. That is, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala brings about incredible change in ways that you would never think, that are inconceivable, imperceptible, beautiful change through means that are, you would say, impossible. So the nafs is the obstacle, but it's the field at the same time. It's the obstacle, I have to confront it. The, what the ulama teach us is the nafs is the idol within. It's the idol within. And it is actually the worst enemy. Because shaitan became, because shaitan became shaitan because of shaitan's nafs. That means the nafs is worse than shaitan. Shaitan only preys on my nafs. He became shaitan because of his nafs. So that proves the danger of the nafs. So it is the idol, you know, the idol within that must not be worshipped and obeyed. At the same time, that it's the obstacle and the wall, it's the field of flight, it's the field of travel to the divine. I have to, tra I have to go beyond my nafs to enter into Allah Ta'ala's nearness. So some of the ulama, like, like Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, Allah Ta'ala says, you know, he says, one step and you've arrived. <laughs> one step and you've arrived at Allah's nearness. What's the step? Beyond the nafs. Traverse the nafs. A step beyond the nafs and you have arrived at Allah's nearness. Because your nafs would then be We'll always have a nafs, but it would be balanced. We, we, we're human. We don't annihilate our nafs. We don't eradicate our nafs. We'll always have a nafs. The idea is for the nafs, it drives excessiveness to be stilled, to be brought into quiescence, for it to be balanced. So it's not driving me, motivating me, inciting me to evil. It's not, if you like, my Lord and Master. So that idea of the nafs is both a challenge but the field of training. Because as I grow and I'm traversing the field of my nafs, I'm learning about what I need to change. Oh, that's interesting. Look at that. Look at what lurks inside of me. have to fix that. And then as I grow, whoa, look at that. I didn't know that existed. That feeling that propensity, that disease of the heart, that delusion, that self-admiration, that ostentation, that stinginess, that miserliness, that anger, that love for leadership, that love and attachment to the things of the world. So as I'm traveling the field of my nafs, uh, you could say like the netherworld of my nafs, right? I'm learning about myself. And as I go through it, alhamdulillah, with Allah Ta'ala's grace, and with struggle, and with the tools of tazkiyat to nafs, I'm traversing it. Until when I reach the furthermost boundary of my nafs, and I have gone beyond it, there lies the shore of nearness to the divine. Now I'm at the sea of, just metaphorically, because some of the ulama mentioned this, especially Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, Allah then I flown with my heart and landed at the sea of the shores of nearness to Allah Ta'ala. But for the bird in me to fly, I have to uh, unshackle myself from the attachments, the non shari attachments, specifically the haram attachments, the makruh attachments of my nafs. I have to de-chain bit by bit by bit to then fly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I have to have that. At the same time, it's the challenge, but it's the field of training and the field of journey. And Allah joins between the two in a very beautiful way. It must be that way to come to me. 
must be that way. And that's how I willed it to be for a wisdom, for my wisdom. And then as we are journeying through the nafs, we need to be increasing in our feelings of, shall we say, contingency. Turning to Allah even more. The more I know me, the more opportunity for me to know Him. The more I know me, the more I should be turning to Him. The more I find in me, oh my God, Ya Allah, help me. That is a chance to increase my neediness of Him. And that neediness, إِنَّمَا السَّرَقَاتُ fuqara says Allah Ta'ala when He describes in the Qur'an zakah and the categories of zakah, zakah is only for those who are poor in the legal sense. But zakah in the metaphorical sense, God's gifts are for those who express their need to Him. They're only for those. If I think to the Divine, I'm fine. Will He give me anything? What if I say, Ya Allah, I need. You know, Ya Allah, I need. Ya Aziz, uh, Oh, exalted one, who is for the humiliated one besides you? Ya Qadir, Oh, you of all power, who is it for the weak besides you? Ya Ghani, Fakir Siwak. Oh, the self enriched one, who is it for the poor one? except you. The more I increase in need, the faster the journey. And that's why the ulama say, the fastest door to Allah Ta'ala, أَقْرَبُ بَابٍ يَدْخُلُ فِي لَعَبْدَ عَلَى اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى بَابُ الْإِفْلَاسِ الْمَحْضِ They say that the quickest way to Allah Ta'ala is the door of bankruptcy. And the greatest veil to Allah Ta'ala is the veil of I. I am. I can. It's me. The fastest door is a door of need. The fastest door is a door of realizing my contingency. And so that's how they all connect. These spiritual and rational proofs, they converge on the idea of need and contingency. Jazakumullah khairan. I think that's probably Adan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Wa nashar wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka Allahumma wa natubu ilayk. Jazakumullah khairan.